I'm glad that my son is here today. Amen. And a shock just went down his spine that I mentioned. <laughs> he is beautiful, he is handsome, he is amazing, and he is my son. I met him uh, many years ago in the country of India. And um, we got to know each other, and part of the plan was that he was to become an American citizen. Now, I just have to say those words, and for many of you, it uh, brings up different emotions. Um, Sarah, we know Sarah, she's away on vacation right now in Pennsylvania, uh, but she flew back for one day because it was her day on which she was to have an interview to become an American. Okay, some of us are looking forward to that. Uh, I can tell you that, that I have, have become an American a while ago. Uh, we're going to go to a wedding coming up shortly for my daughter and one of my cousins is having trouble coming to the wedding because he hasn't bothered to become an American before now even though he's been living in this country as a resident alien for many years. Yes, we lived in Canada for a while and we started the process of becoming citizens of Canada. You can hold two passports as far as America is concerned. You can have a Canadian passport. You can be a dual citizen. It's a good thing. And in years to come, that may be part of who we are. But as we traveled from Pune, a small town of three million, it's a college town, it's where we as a Seventh-day Adventist church have a college, a university now called Spicer University. Some of you know this. But there's also a public university in the town of Pune. We traveled from there to New Delhi. I ate at Subway this week. And one of the ladies, her name was Pinky, she served me my sub. And I knew by the look of her that she was from India, and so I asked which part of India she was from, and she told me, New Delhi. And no, this is not the Delhi where you buy the salami. <laughs> this is Delhi, the Indian town that has grown so big that there is an old Delhi, and now there is a new Delhi. And this is where the American uh, consulate is. And this consulate is where you have the ambassador from the United States to the country of India. And then you have the assistant ambassador, and then you have the person number three on the list who is in charge of the embassy. He's a State Department worker, or she, depending on who's appointed, and they go to these places and they live for three to four years, and then they rotate back to the United States usually to the State Department to do something else for the government, and so their, their life goes. They rotate back and forth, these State Department workers, and sometimes they rise in the ranks. Well, my friend, John Nay, shout out to John Nay if he's watching, was the number three guy at the American Embassy in India when I met my son. And we took him to this embassy, and in the, in the brochure that we were told, expect for this process to take three days. So plan in your itinerary to have three days in which to complete this registration and, and uh, citizenship process because prior to our doing this, there had been a law enacted in the United States that says, if you adopt a child from foreign lands, you can bring them to the embassy and they can be made a citizen of the United States by fact of your adoption of them. That is 
still the, still the case today. So here we go, we fly to New Delhi, and as we get there, we, we are picked up at the airport in a very nice car. It happened to be the car that John, the number three guy at the embassy, sent for us. Because you see, we were going to stay at his house. This is a house that is rented by the American government for the number three guy at the consulate. He's the consul general. That's what they call him. And they, they whisked us around. We're, we're going between other cars and buses and motorcycles and, 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 you know, right there in the middle, eating the grass out of the median was a nice big Brahmin cow. These are the sights and sounds and smells of India. We were entranced. We were, we were also very tired. We, we, we're going through this very emotional experience of, of, of meeting our, our son for the first time. But we were to be the guests of the Consul General. We stayed the night. The next day we got up. He had already gone to work. His, the car came back and his driver took us to the embassy. When you get to the embassy, it's my wife, my daughter, myself, my son. We walk in, and all these people who are looking to get a visa to go to these United States or looking for some uh, arrangement with the American government are sitting there waiting. These are all Indian individuals. And we walk in, and I don't exactly look like I was born in India. And we're holding Callan, and we walk right in, and we don't stop and go and sit in chairs. No, no, no. We keep walking. And we are met at the door by a very official-looking man who greets us and says, right this way. And we go right past the doors that everyone else is trying to get into. We go into a back room. It's a little conference room. And we are met there by one of the workers in the embassy who swears us in and takes care of what was supposed to happen over three days in less than half an hour. My son became an American citizen that day and was able to fly home with us. And when immigration looked at his passport, it was an Indian passport, it also had in it a piece of paper that said he will soon be issued an American passport. We were there as the friends of the king, the friends of the consul general. We were there as citizens. We were there as, as people who were connected to the American family. And I'm telling you, it left such an impression upon me about what it means to be included, what it means to be part of the family, and what it means to be connected to the people who can make you part of the family. We had decided to become parents again. That was our decision. The decision of the American government was to grant him citizenship alongside his parents. Make him part of the American family. It's an incredible feeling. It's an incredible feeling to know that you are part of a big, big family that the rest of the world, in many respects, when it comes to America, is looking at, even with the troubles we're going through, and saying, that is a great nation. That is an incredible nation. Maybe someday I can be part of that people. They look at it for various reasons. As I've said, my father brought us here from South Africa with very little, two suitcases to be precise, 
to the land of milk and money. Any of you get any of that this week? Did your hard work mean that you could go to the store this week and buy some milk and honey? Come on. Talk to me. We're Americans. We, we can do this without anybody saying, Hey, you don't deserve any milk and honey. You can say, Hey, but I worked for this. I have money. Take my money. I want some milk and honey. So that I can have some honey in my, in my tea. Or I can have some milk on my cereal. We're part of something that we have been invited into. Some of us have been born into this. And so we don't think about what it means to be part of this great nation. And I'm not going to go on so much about that, except that I'm hoping that you are swelling with pride at this moment so that I can stick my knife in you. This month, we have been looking at the entire Word of God. Thank you, Joe Trumbull, for saying that the Word of God is an incredible gift. It is a gift that he gives us so that we can know him and how he has been interacting with humanity since the beginning. We started with the Pentateuch. Those first five books in the Bible, we moved on to the prophets, and then last week we touched on the wisdom books. When you take those three sections together, you have the entire Hebrew Bible. Now today, in reverse order in some respects, we are dealing with the good news in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Now, when you see the front cover of your bulletin, you see a beautiful picture, and in that, in that moment you see, you see this, this, this big, biggish man. Uh, you know, I'm going to just tell you that if I was to draw a picture of the Apostle Paul, he would not look like this. My picture is of a stalwart individual, but probably not somebody of huge stature. His brain was bigger than his shoulders. He was a rabbi. He was a Jew of Jews, so he said. He was one who identified with the people of the chosen ones. So today we look at that next week. Don't miss don't worry, I'm not the pastor who says if you miss church, you're going to hell. <laughs> That's not me. But if the Holy Spirit says you need to be here next week because we're having communion, then you should be here. And we will deal with the gospel in the gospels, which is the other part of the New Testament. So by the end of this month, you will have traveled through the entire Bible and you will see what I have seen, what I believe you already know, but just need to be told again for the sake of swelling pride that God has given us his message in the Bible and the message is the same, whether it's the Pentateuch, whether it's the prophets, whether it's the wisdom books, whether it's the writings of Paul or next week, whether it's the gospels, the news is the same. He loves you, and he wants you back. He wants to spend eternity with you however he defines eternity. He wants to spend that time with you, and he wants you to, to, to invite your family, to invite your friends, to spend that eternal life with you and with him. That's the good news. That's, that, that's the good news.
See, the Bible, I believe, is, 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 is full of this good news about our Creator, our King, our Father God. He lost us, you know. I don't know if you've ever lost your kid, but it's probably one of the most uh, uh, exciting moments of your life. And I don't mean that in a good way. All right? I got probably the worst spanking of my life from my father who thought he had lost me and then punished me for making him think that he had lost me. See how that goes, parents? I remember it. Believe me, I remember it. Maybe you don't want those memories in your kids' minds. I, I don't know, but uh, he was very, very upset with me and uh, let me know it in no uncertain terms. And believe me, I never, I never got lost again. I, uh, whether it was on purpose, actually it was just a, I forgot the meeting time and I wasn't there and he thought he'd lost me and so he was upset. And uh, upsetness is not a good time to dispense wisdom to the rear end of children. It's, it's not a good time. You see, our Heavenly Father lost us. He lost us to our own disobedience. Our forefathers, mother and father, decided to disobey God, and He lost us. He lost us to our desire to do things our own way. No, we didn't want to follow. So that picture that I have in my mind happened this morning. Uh, our, our, our dear uh, sister had her, her son up here. No, at the back, maybe you couldn't see. But he was not listening to Joe. He wanted to go see Lee. And mom had to hold on to him. And when she let go, he went his own way. And that's what Isaiah says, doesn't, doesn't he? All we like sheep have gone astray, each one and, that's men and women, to his or her own way. God lost us. He lost us to doing things our own way. Well, maybe it was the way that the arch rebel hinted would be better than following God, tricked us into thinking that it was our own way. When meanwhile, it was his way that he was getting us to follow. And if you feel that this week you have followed him in any way and you have gone, quote unquote, your own way, then I'm really glad you're here because you're in good company. I think the rest of us feel that way too. And one of the good things about getting together on a Sabbath morning is to claim Jesus' grace and love for ourselves again and to look into our brothers' and sisters' eyes and say, Jesus loves you, died to save you, and has given you grace to live another week. Amen. And to know that you are forgiven. So if you don't feel forgiven when you leave this place, I'm sorry. Maybe I didn't say it loud enough. You are forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ, by his power, by his strength, by his blood, you are forgiven. If that's what you came for here today, I'm just wanting to tell you, you are forgiven. It's good news. It's good news. But there are two points that I want us to remember very, very uh, specifically about the writings of Paul, and I've, I've chosen a couple of pieces and I was privileged to be part of the, the class that is meeting again in my office and just absolutely stuffed and packed it more than I've ever seen it and that's just great. They were looking at the book of Galatians today and that's where I want you to go if you have your phones or your Bible in front of you. Galatians chapter 3. First point. The good news is for everyone. Now, Paul has spent his life becoming the rabbi of rabbis. He's, he, he was to be the next Gamaliel because that's who his teacher was and his teacher was making him into exactly who he was to become when he got knocked off his horse on his way to Damascus. His trajectory was, 
radically changed at that point, and he spent three years out in the desert recalibrating his hard drive. Okay? Because if he was gonna, if he was the rabbi that I think he was, he had the Hebrew Bible that we have just referenced, he had that Bible memorized. The whole thing. And the writings of the rabbis that had come before him. He had that all memorized. Okay? So he had to recalibrate that, and he came to the, the conclusion that everybody is involved. That this is for everybody, and in fact, that God himself was calling him to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, this, this is not easy to relate to, except, and I, and I thank Paul Cardi for taking his class there today, they were thinking about what, is, what does it mean to be an Adventist and what part of being an Adventist is difficult in our culture today and maybe needs to be thought about so that we can make it rational to people that we meet every day. Paul had to do the same thing. He had to say, ah, I've got, I understand now. Uh, this, this message that has come formally to just Jewish people who were born into this is now to be given to people who were not born into this. And I'm the one who's supposed to go do this. How on earth do I make something that is relevant to an entire special chosen people, how do I make that relevant to a people who have no background, who have no context. What is going to transfer over? How am I going to do this? I think this is all part of what Paul was going through when he was in the desert before he got to Jerusalem. And when he gets to Jerusalem, it takes Barnabas, remember? It takes Barnabas to encourage everybody to just calm down. This guy's no longer a persecutor. He's no longer going to take you to jail. He is being called and commissioned by God to be an emissary for him to the Gentiles. I think when they heard this, they were not only very, very happy that this was the turn of events, but they were very, very happy that it was Paul. Because they were just as soon ready to see him leave Jerusalem. Okay? I know that may be a strange thing to say about the apostles. But today, even, there was a little reading about another interaction between Paul and Peter. And Paul calls Peter out and says, you were living this way over here with these people, but now you're with us and you're living a different way. Which are you? Because, you see, I don't think Paul and Peter eh, really saw eye to eye on a lot on a lot of things okay so Peter was probably very glad to say let's pray for this brother right now <laughs> and, and, and we're gonna put him on a boat to Antioch tonight <laughs> you see what I'm saying he, 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 he knew that God was moving in this guy's life but but he was also scared of him he was also not very happy that he was now part of the family and so when God said, I am going to send him to the Gentiles. Remember the word that I told you that we have in the Adventist church that we use for Gentiles? Anyone? Non-Adventists. <laughs> Strike it. Strike it from your vocabulary. As of today, I implore you. If you learn nothing else today, don't ever use that word again. It's a hyphenated word, I know but it means exactly the same thing as Gentile. Because to a Jew, a Gentile is simple, simply somebody who isn't a Jew. Are you, are you feeling now a little more of the import of the fact that this point that we are making right now is that the good news, Paul is making the point, the good news is for everyone and how the people in Jerusalem felt about that 
I'm not so sure that they were jumping for joy. In fact, we have a whole group of people that Paul calls the Judaizers who went behind him when he would set up a church. They would go behind him and they would tell the new fresh believers that were coming to a relationship in Jesus Christ, you know what? You need Jesus and. You need Jesus and. And they would list things that came from the previous tradition of the chosen people because they were feeling that if you didn't do those things, you couldn't be part of the family. Hence my imploring you not to use the phrase non-Adventist because by using that phrase, you are saying the very same thing. You don't do these things, therefore you are a non-Adventist. You get my drift? You're a Gentile. So what I want you to hear from the Apostle Paul today, who was sent to the Gentiles, is the gospel, the good news, is for everybody. Amen? Amen. That means... I don't care what you've done, I don't care where you're from, I don't care who your family is, your mama, your daddy, anybody. I don't care what you think defines you. The gospel is for you. The good news of Jesus coming to this world and telling us that God wants us back is for everybody. Now, you know, I have to throw in John 3.16, of course. We love to read that so quickly, and we forget how revolutionary that statement was for Jesus to make to a rabbi known as Nicodemus. Don't you know, Nicodemus? The good news is for everybody, not just Jews, not just the chosen people who are born into it. No, no, no. It's, it's for everybody. Second thing I want you to know today, and this, this, is the, this is the really fun part, Lee. Really, I'm going to tell you. Good news is personified. I'm going to go for my English. My wife is an English teacher. Okay, you ready? What does it mean to personify? You just have to watch a cartoon, and then you know what I'm talking about. If we were to give a face to this flower and make it into a person, that would be personification, okay? So Jesus is the personification of the good news. I say it more simply, Jesus is the plan, period. Jesus coming is God's plan to save humanity, period. He came so that we would know him better, so that we would want to choose to come back. Because remember what Isaiah said? All we like sheep have left him. We've all left him. And he wants us back. He wants us to be part of his family. And he has sent Jesus to tell us, I want you back. That's, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. The good news is personified in Jesus Christ and, and his mission. And so we go to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, one of Paul's letters to his Corinthian church. Have you ever studied the history of Corinth? If you haven't, you can look it up on Google this afternoon, or maybe right now, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the point is this, Corinth, uh, um, I don't know, let's, let's name... Go ahead, Paul, tell me. You've lived here a long time. What's, what's that neighborhood in L.A. that uh, we just know? I mean, it's, it's the place where you can get anything, do anything, and uh, mostly get away with it. Do we say that's Hollywood still? I don't know. Huh? Okay, so there was a neighborhood. It was called Corinth. And let me tell you, there was some, there was some people there that were pretty rough. And they did some rough things. And they lived in some rough ways. 
And Paul goes there and tells them, hey, good news, you're included. You're in. Jesus loves you, died to save you, and he's coming back to get you. <laughs> and they went, what? Me? Are you kidding? Talking, talking to me? I don't believe it. Yes, I'm talking to you. So he sets up a church. The two letters that we do have that have Corinth written on them are actually, we know, because if you read carefully between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, you'll find in 2 Corinthians that he actually refers to something in his last letter that you can't find in 1 Corinthians. So what is that evidence of? Another letter. Another letter. Yeah. So these, these letters that Paul has in the Bible are some of the ones that we do have. The likelihood is that there are others. Okay? And so he writes to his family, his new church that he has planted in Corinth, and he, he says some things to them which I, I, I find pretty incredible. But he's, he, this is Paul. He, he doesn't mess around. Okay? He says... God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached. This is uh, 1 verse 21. The foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demanded mir miraculous signs and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Greeks. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were. Oh, now he's, now he's going to go to meddling. Are you ready? He's going to tell these people what they were. Woo! What, uh, that when you were called, not many of you were wise. You dum-dums. You know, when this message came to you, you, you were not the intelligentsia. Okay? Uh, this is not that, well, it's interesting to me because uh, of the people he's talking to, I'm wondering if they're going, yeah, I know, I'm not educated or anything. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But, and this is, this, again, you must understand when the Apostle Paul puts a B-U-T in there, he's making a pivot. He's making a pivot. He's, he's going another direction. Watch this. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and, and, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. So that no one may boast before him. Yeah. I'm a Christian. And it's because of me. Don't you see? No, none of that. It is because of him that you are in Christ, because, uh, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, what? Boast in the Lord, because he's done it all. He had to remind them. He'd obviously told them this before, but he had to remind them that it had nothing to do with who they were or where they came from, because somebody had been telling them, you're not part of the family because you haven't done this or you haven't been that. So Paul has to remind them. It doesn't matter where you come from. You want to be part of the family of God? It's going to happen because God makes it happen. Just like us going to John Nay's house. We were part of, 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 of this situation where because we knew the consul general, we just walked by everybody else. We took care of our business in half an hour instead of three days. That's what it means to be part of the family, to know people, for people to vouch for you and to wipe away the red tape and say, he's, he's us, he's part of us. That's an incredible, incredible feeling. And, and, and Paul is reminding the brothers 
He says, when I came to you, this is now for chapter 2, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God? No, for I resolved, this is verse 2, and I want you to hear Paul today, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, Adventist Church, what do you want people to know about you? I think, I think it was you, Kit, that said this morning, when people find out I'm an Adventist, oh yeah, you're the people who don't dance. Oh yeah, you're the people who don't wear jewelry. Or eat meat. Or, or, or. I am pained. Pained, my friends, when people don't say, you're the people who love Jesus. Come on now. Paul says, I don't want people to know me for what I was. I don't want people to know me for that long-standing tradition. I want people to know that by faith, anyone and everyone can receive the promise of connection with the God of heaven. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter where you come from. It all started with Adam and Eve, as I told you. It moved on to the fact that she had a son. She named him Cain. I'll tell you that story another time. They were given the responsibility to do a sacrifice every day. So blood was spilled on a daily basis for the remission of sins. This began at the beginning of the rebellion. Then later on, there was a man named Abram who was chosen. This is all stuff that Paul knows, by the way. So when he just said, I have decided not to know anything. I've decided not to, be, not to be judged by anything else except Jesus Christ. I want you to know what Paul was saying. I want you to know what he was saying he was not caring about. Those people came from Abraham. They went to live in Canaan. And God said, this will be your land. Then they all went to Egypt and they joined Joseph, and after many years, they started waiting because the Messiah was supposed to be coming. Ever heard that in the Adventist church? Jesus is supposed to be coming, but they were waiting. They were waiting. The Baptist shows up, and they ask him, are you the Messiah? And he says, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm the one who's telling you that he's coming real soon, real soon. And in fact, that day that he points him out, he says, there he is. Pray, God, that you have an opportunity this week to point somebody to the Lamb of God, to be John the Baptist in 2017 and say, there he is. Pray, God, that you have an opportunity to, to be included in those people who are pointing to Jesus. See, Paul knew this. So when Jesus actually comes and does his ministry, he blows it up. He completely blows it up. And I'm going to enca encapsulate that in just two words for you. Everything that you've read in the past is all about y'all come. What are the last words of Jesus? Y'all go. And he doesn't say to stop in Samaria, does he? He doesn't say to stop in Judea. He says to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, to the whole world. Question. Did they listen? Answer. Well, maybe more so after Paul. But do we ever hear about Peter leaving Jerusalem? Did Peter go? Don't think so. I think he stayed to be general conference president, but, you know. Um, 
Am I, am I right? He stayed to do the organization. He did not go. Okay? Be very interesting if he had. This is the crucial difference that Jesus makes in the mission that he has with, with humanity. Before, it's been all these people, descendants of Abraham, and all they could say was, if you want to know God, come and see. Jesus turns that around and he says, you need to go to the Philippines. You need to go to Malaysia. You need to go to Antarctica. You need to, you need to go and tell all nations that I want them all back. Jesus is the personification of God's plan to bring us back home. This is the good news. This is what Paul is talking about. And he has the right, he has the right to say, I am a Jew of Jews. I'm, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Jew of Jews. But I have decided that, that that is not what I'm going to be defined by. I'm going to be defined as a follower of Christ. Amen. A Christian, if you like. So the choice, my friends, the choice is, is, is ours today. As we look, as we thank you again, Joe, great children's story. As, as we read this book and we see God's interaction with his people over time from the very beginning of the rebellion up until today, we need to remember these two things. Number one, the gospel is for everyone and that Jesus is the personification of God's plan and that plan is, I want you all to come home. Amen.